United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have uh, Ms. Castine here and Ms. Lasko Kerr. Absent, we have Matt Jewett and Annette Sex Sexton Ruiz. I want to welcome everyone to tonight's board meeting and remind the audience of the request to, to address board cards that must be completed and submitted to the board secretary if they wish to speak to an agenda item. Board policy provides for two cards. The white cards to be submitted in order to speak to an agenda item, and the blue cards to be submitted in order to speak during public comments. Policy also states there is a five minute maximum in order to speak during, or there is a five minute maximum time limit per speaker. Due to the open meeting law, board members are not allowed to address items that are not on the agenda. If you do not want to address the board, but wish to give your comments in writing, Please do so on a goldenrod sheet, and all members will receive a copy. We have approval of the agenda. Is there a motion? I move the governing board approve the agenda as presented. Okay. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. <coughs> Next, we have approval of minutes. We have minutes for the regular board meeting on April 23rd, the regular board meeting on May 21st, the special board meeting executive session on June 28th, and the regular board meeting June 18th, <laughs> and the regular board meeting held June 18th. There is a motion that will approve all of the minutes at once. At the very bottom, it's three, um, letter E, if someone wants to make that motion or we can do each individually. I move the governing board approve the four referenced minutes as submitted. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Public comments. We have two public comment cards. The first one is from James Diaz. Can you join us at the podium and please provide your name, address, and you have five minutes to speak. Good evening, governing board members and administration. Uh, my name is James Diaz, uh, 4653 East St. Charles Avenue. And uh, this is just to officially introduce myself as the Creighton Education Association president. I was elected uh, back in May and um, I wanted to officially introduce myself as the president and to give you a little bit of background on what we've been doing since uh, I was elected. Um, uh, one of the things that we did is we, uh, some of the things that we did over the summer is we met as a uh, as elected officers and as a team for CEA to try to uh, decide and uh, figure out ways about uh, developing a vision for CEA for the for this year and some of the things that we can do to help support and to help uh, encourage a sense of community within our district, which is very important to us. Um, the, when we were talking about it, there was two themes that kind of came up to the top, and one of them in particular was this idea of staff as a professional, uh, classified staff, certified staff. It's a very important concept to us that I don't think that everybody, um, I don't think that everybody conceptualizes themselves and everybody embraces themselves. So the idea of staff as a professional, uh, the other thing which is very important to us and we feel is intimately connected is student achievement. Um, but something that is a key aspect of what we do, and we want to make sure that that is at the forefront of everything that is um, in our decision-making process. Uh, when, uh, when we were at the new teacher event uh, with, um, with Dr. Lugo and um, other new teachers that came, uh, the message that we sent that uh, was very clear 
was uh, because some people have misconceptions about what a professional association is and what a professional association is not. Um, our major goal is to make sure that everybody understands that our purpose is to go through and make sure that rules and procedures are followed, and that's it. Um, that's not really anything more than what we do. Some people have uh, misconceptions based on their experiences and the things that they bring to the table, uh, that they feel like a, uh, an association is an obstacle to student achievement, it's an obstacle to uh, growth, and um, that is not who we are. Um, some people feel like uh, professional associations are a um, protect bad teaching or bad staff. That is not who we are, and we want to make sure that that, cons that, that idea is crystal clear. Um, so when we talked to new teachers, we wanted to make sure that everybody understood where we were coming at as an association and something that we felt that was important for people to do. Um, in terms of some of the things that we're talking about and trying to go through and move forward was uh, trying to communicate with people. We feel that the only way that you can really help somebody and support somebody is if you know them. Uh, so uh, one of my things that I did as an individual and my personal goals over the summer was I made it my goal to call every CEA member that I could. I started in June and I'm not done yet, I'm about three quarters of the way. Um, and uh, I had conversations and uh, talked with them. Uh, it was very nice uh, as soon as they realized that I wasn't a telemarketer trying to sell them something. Um, it was a very nice experience and I think it's a good starting point to developing those relationships which are very important important. Um, so that was one of the things that we did. We're very interested in the idea of mentorship and trying to try to see if we can uh, see if we can encourage that in some capacity for our district. Uh, we're definitely very interested in working as collaborative partners um, in trying to make sure that the district is successful and obviously um, a big thing which is in our district which is related to staff retention is trying to support new staff to make sure that they uh, feel like they're successful and that they continue with our district which is a great place to be. So I um, just wanted to say that we stand ready to work together and try to uh, make the district as successful as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diaz. The next public comment is from Renee Dayton. Can you please come to the podium and say your name and your address? And you have five minutes to speak. Hi, my name is Renee Dayton. My address is 3424 East Flower Street. I'm not new to Arizona, but I'm new to the district. I have two kids at Monta Vista School this year, and just a general comment about the paperwork that came home for open house and meeting the teachers and, and what the kids needed. I was a little confused, and, uh, <laughs> and we're us getting wish lists about what the classroom needed, and I totally understood that, but I left the Dollar Tree store going, there is nothing written in here about what my individual child needs, and we didn't get that paperwork until now Tuesday so there's extra trips to the store about um, our kids not being at school on the first day with what they needed in their backpack what was you know what might have been nice to know that they needed pencils or if that was even allowed or um, things of that nature um, that was just one little issue I had um, and paperwork that came back today as well was how to access the uh, the lunch and the paid lunch and the pricing and here's the website that you go to that would have been nice to have for parents you know and about the same time as the open house so we can kind of navigate the system as first time parents in the school in the school system with kids using these lunch cards and knowing where we fit in if we apply or, or if we um, don't even need if we don't we don't we're not approved or if, you know um, if we're not low income or what you know we fall into to know that so that we can have money in that account or whatever I need to read the paperwork tonight to see uh, what we need to do to get them ready for Wednesday so it's just a little delayed and would have been nice to be a little bit more organized for the first day of school for my kids and that's my main comment suggestion hopefully for next year <laughs> thank you thank you Miss Dayton Next, we have the superintendent's report, Dr. Boyle. Thank you. Um, I would like to welcome everyone this evening to our first governing board of 2013-14. Uh, yesterday was our first day of uh, 
uh, school and um, also I'll mention on Saturday our governing board met in this boardroom from 8.30 to 4.30 in, in planning. Um, on our first day of school yesterday, we I want to share that there was a power outage at one of our schools, Monte Vista, and I'd like to recognize all the people who sprung into action and made sure that our students uh, had a place to go, a place to eat lunch, and a place to study for the remainder of the day. So um, I just would like to recognize Kathy Irwin, a director of transportation, who transported students from Monte Vista to Papago School. I also would like to recognize Linda Doherty, our food service director, who uh, made sure that there was adequate food for both uh, schools of students at lunchtime, um, both um, Papago and Monte Vista. Also to the principals, the um, Mike Madison and his staff from Monte Vista, and, and Jeff Geyer, the principal at Papago, for welcoming um, over 600 students to their campus. So there are many others. Uh, Ed Stoltz took care of the um, information to parents. And at the end of the day, students were where they needed to be. So again, commendations to everyone, and uh, certainly to Dr. Bogner, who orchestrated that event. Uh, secondly, I'd like to share um, uh, that um, our governing board and uh, staff is really interested in retention of teachers. And to that end, uh, they are interested in, in data. Uh, this evening in, the, in your board bulletin, there is some information on comparison of retention of teachers. But also, um, I was told just prior to coming to uh, this meeting that there had been a couple other statistics that had uh, um, that were in place, and one is quite interesting in that um, in the last five years we have rehired staff, uh, 33 staff members who worked in our district and then um, chose for one reason or another to leave but came back, and in the last two years uh, we see that there are 19 staff members who returned, so we always are very sad to see our, our very uh, important, well-qualified, supportive staff members who leave, but it's uh, reassuring that some have returned. Um, so with that, again, I welcome you to our board meeting this evening, and uh, welcome you at any time during the year to attend our meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boyle. The next item is number six, approval of consent agenda. Is there a motion? Oh, and let the record state that another board member has joined us, Annette Sexton Ruiz. Joined us at 7.05 p.m. Thank you, Hilda. Sorry. It's okay. Is there a motion for the approval of consent? I move the governing board approve consent agenda items A through E in accordance with policy BEDB-R. Is there a second? I second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. The next item is under personnel. Governing board ASAB AS dyslexic today. Governing board ASBA policy advisories 473 to 475, first reading and adoption. Dr. Boyle? Okay. Um, Dr. Luco. Good evening, uh, board members and cabinet. Thank you for having me here this evening. Um, I just um, we have received a number of policy advisories uh, that all relate to the changes in the law um, via House Bill 2500 that pertain to our policies. And one of the recommendations from ASBA was to um, have only one reading because the policies are retroactive um, and no evaluations can be done until we have adopted uh, the policies that uh, are here. So that is a recommendation. 
So the first policy, oh, and I also wanted to, to uh, let you know that a survey went out and you did receive a copy of the survey and the responses on Saturday uh, because we were trying our best to get public input from our teachers uh, when the policy advisory came out in the summer. So it, the uh, survey went out on, it, July 2nd or July 3rd and it was open until August 1st. So you'll see there's 64 respondents. So I'm going to go through the survey real quick, quickly to, sh to show you what's there and how it relates to, to um, what we have. So you'll see there's 64 respondents. Many of them were classroom teachers. So one of the, the policies uh, in GCO uh, asks, requires the board to de adopt a definition of inadequate uh, classroom performance. So we'll see that when we go to a GCO and we receive, okay, so here this uh, definition, proposed definition is a blending of our current policy and um, which has one ineffective in one area and overall as a whole. Um, and you can see that the, the teachers, when they gave input on this policy, it was not a real strong um, support. And the reason for that, when you read the comments, we're really around only having one indicator for ineffective, which is currently in place, and there'll be a recommendation further on based on a teacher input. So before we go any further with the survey, I want to direct you. So the first policy <coughs> will be, I've got all these stickies and now I've disorganized myself is GCJ, and that's in your book. I don't have my book page page number. Do you have the policy GCJ in front of you? Do you have page numbers? Okay. So that first policy um, has the de definition of continuing teachers versus probationary teachers. The uh, continuing teacher has been employed in the school district for more than three consecutive years and does, does not have a rating of ineffective. And a probationary teacher, formally we, we call them non-continuing teachers, is, is that teacher who has less than three years of experience or has been designated ineffective. So that's policy GCJ. The next one is policy GCK. And what this policy talks about is um, the transferring of teachers. And if a teacher has been designated in the lowest performance classifications, there, there are guidelines against transferring them unless it's approved by the board to be in the best interest of the students. Okay, so then the next policy is GCO, and this is really where the survey starts. So I kind of jumped the gun on that for you. So my apologies. So the first part talks about the different definitions. And then um, on the next page, it talks about the district will in involve the uh, teachers in the development of a periodic evaluation system. So we do have an evaluation committee in place. It started off with, oh gosh, in November of 2010 when the governing board had an advisory committee uh, meeting and we we met for a couple of years to develop the uh, evaluation tool now over the summer we had about eight teachers giving up their time this summer to work on this then on the next page am I going too fast just stop me if you have any questions can you yeah can you yep. up for a moment? absolutely Thank you. 
Okay. Okay. So then, then we have the next part where we, the top of the page talks about the evaluation guidelines for non-continuing, for probationary versus continuing teachers. And prior to House Bill 2500, all teachers needed to have four, uh, two formal evaluations. This um, policy here states that if you're a continuing teacher who's been rated effective or highly effective, you only need one formal uh, observation unless the teacher requests. So that will be a change for our teachers because they're our continuing teachers are used to doing their formal evaluation, their formal observation piece at the end of the year. We'll now move it to the beginning of the year so that we can meet requirements should the teacher request another observation because they need to be 60 days apart. Can I ask a question? So can, Susan, can you talk through, and it's been a little while so I apologize, on our performance rubric, are we using the same performance designations then? Yes. So we have highly effective, effective, active. developing, and ineffective. Um, so just, I guess philosophically, I know that this the guidance document says that if the teacher performance is rated effective or highly effective on the first observation, given the fact that this teacher evaluation is requiring us to really ultimately make decisions based on student achievement data, um, and then linking that to the observation, I'm a little uneasy about saying to a teacher, we're going to come in and observe you in the beginning of the school year, do a full observation, pre-conference, observation, post-conference, come up with your summative observation score, and then wait you know, until we see student achievement data. And then I'll be at wait until after the student achievement data is long past due, because right Ames, we've got this lag. Um, so we've got current grade level data with our benchmarks and other assessments that are going to be integrated in there. It seems to me like, one, it's not in the best interest of teachers, ultimately, to do a single observation and, and one, make them ask for a second one mm -hmm. versus staying with the procedure that the district's been very comfortable with. So. This is obviously an option for the governing board. So can you describe why you're recommending us go into one observation as opposed to staying with two? Yeah, um, so the, the recommendation to go with one observation and do, to, to do it in the beginning of, of the school year is in our tool, we have also we also discussed that if a principal sees that a teacher is starting to slip, that at any time <coughs> the principal can schedule another form, a complete formal observation, um, should they deem necessary. There, there also for each formal observation, there will be a, a minimum four informal observations that will be conducted, and informal observations are. Um, expected throughout throughout the year. So if, if they're seeing that, you know, based on data, um, based on observations, they, they could do another one. What I would recommend against is waiting for, if you're only going to do one formal observation, waiting until the end of the year to do so, because um, then you have that requirement that you need to have them 60 days apart before you do another one. So, um, should the board decide that we keep two in place, we can do we can do that. It's um, the number of observations required, and the the time um, is is a factor for our principal. And do you mean because of the statutory reference to sixty days between mm -hmm. the two? Because obviously the number is still the same. It's just that the legislature's made it nice to quantify the amount of days between. Right. So just logistically, it, just it makes it much more complicated. I didn't notice, and I'm trying to scan back through, I apologize, um, that your description of administration's option to do additional value observations, formal observations, in the event that they deem necessary, I didn't see that reflected. It, it's not reflected in, in our policy, it's reflected in our evaluation tool. 
But so if it's not in our policy, it doesn't. I don't think it matters what's in our evaluation tool, right? So if our policy says you only get one if you're a continuing teacher unless the teacher requests one, then the the protocol and the you know, procedures that we use don't circumvent the policy that we have. So that's what my concern is: is if we adopt a policy that indicates that only a teacher can ask for a second mm -hmm. formal observation and we have an administration that says, oh, I think we need to schedule another one, we now put that teacher and that administrator in a position of conflict because we have a policy that doesn't allow the administrator to do that, even though it's probably in the best interest of the students in their classroom. So that's why I just wanted to make sure that we're not setting up ourselves, anybody, teachers or administrators, to be in a position of not having as much flexibility as we can you know, grant them. So unless I'm reading that incorrectly, I don't know if anyone else saw that. I'm trying to get back to that page. It's a 19 page advisory, thank you, ASBA. It's a little hard to get through it all, but. I mean, I don't know. I mean, that, that's my understanding, at least, is that you know, board policy defines what we're allowed to do, and we may have procedures in place, but they can't circumvent the intention of the policy and it, it went in that in what I saw at least where we have explicitly teacher underlined as the only person who can request a second you know formal observation my worry is then that means no you know that that's just the teacher that can request that <coughs> I, go ahead. I'll keep going okay. if you want. I don't yeah. know that the, all the board members have even seen the evaluation tool. So can, can you get that to us? Let's I have it. copies here. Okay. So if you like this. What? I remember it. You remember it? <laughs> I remember <laughs> it. I think it's it changed a bit. We won't ask you how long ago that was. <laughs> Do board members want a few minutes to look at this, or do you want uh, Dr. Lugo to continue with her presentation? You know, I'd like a minute or two to take a look at it, okay. if that's okay. I too. okay. Sorry, Susan. No, that's okay. You can have a seat if you'd like. <laughs> it's more comfortable. Oh, I have a great question, actually. Okay, so looking at the ASBA, uh, the policy services advisory. I notice, um, on, I guess it's page three, that there were two sample questions here. Um, underneath the little dotted part where it says inadequacy of classroom performance, but then on the survey that was given, I see only one of the questions. And I don't, uh, somewhere in here, I'm sorry, I highlighted it like crazy. Um, oh, here we go. It says right here, comment nine, this definition must be developed in consultation with the district's teachers. Um, and uh, I don't I, I don't see where it says that that's how this was developed. Okay, so because this, this came out in the summer, so we, we've had that on a couple of agendas with our Title II uh, meetings, but we never got to formalization of any um, incentive. We have discussed incentives for teachers and incentives for transfer, um, but we did not get to anything formal in those meetings. And when the policy advisory came out, the consultation for teachers um, was putting out the survey, and we had 64 respondents of um, they didn't, the, so those 64 people didn't create the question. They were just answering whether they like agreed with the question. Correct. Okay. The evaluation committee, didn't they meet over the summer? We did meet over the summer. And they didn't help develop the... the we, we discussed the very briefly. They did not develop the questions. Okay. And if we could just hold questions for a few minutes while we can review. That's okay. Review the evaluation packet. And if you guys can let me know when you're ready to move on.
more time? Okay. Annette, do you want more time? I have just a moment. Audience, thank you very much for your patience. Sometimes we need a little bit more time to digest information, and we appreciate that. All right. Go ahead. Okay. So, when it comes to the definition of inadequate classroom performance, as I said, if you look down at, at that bullet part of that page, 59% um, of the staff agreed or strongly agreed with this definition that was proposed. Um, and based on the comments that, and I, the comments aren't on this display, but that were given out on Saturday, the um, the comments all revolved around the one indicator of um, inadequate. Um, so we moved the performance rating of ineffective to two or more, as was suggested in the comments, under A. And then under B, the rating of the district standard evaluation system as a whole. And then C is required for 2015-16 to look at those teachers who are in the lowest performance the classification for more than two years in a row in that developing um, classification. So can I ask you a question? So this, the, what's up on the screen right now, mm -hmm. it says, you know, the, so there are two discrete options. And we're asking the respondents to tell us how they feel about, I. So if I'm interpreting that and I want to tell you I like the rating of ineffective with respect to the district's evaluation as a whole, I have no way of telling you that that's the part that I am strongly agreeing with. 
because those two pieces are combined together. They're distinctly different options in the policy advisory, because I'm looking at page three of 19, um, and it, that's where it lays out during any school year, options A and B with number one, or during each year of two consecutive years, the teacher is either A or B. So it isn't the combining of all four of those options in terms of a definition or the combining of two of these options. So I'm not sure how you, I don't think we can interpret the results of this particular question because I don't know what they were really responding to. If we had individual questions for each of the two options, and they would have been able to say, I strongly agree or disagree with one statement, and then I strongly or agree or disagree with another statement, we would then be able to say, okay, which one of the two statements are they most in favor of? But now we know that they strongly agree or disagree with us, the combination of statements, but we are left having to make a decision about which of those two should we be selecting. Um, so I, mean, I don't know that that piece of data is going to help make a decision. I mean, I have an opinion looking at the policy advisory, but I don't know that that's necessarily informed by the survey results, which is disappointing because I don't think that that's what the intention of your asking the teachers to respond to the survey was. Um, so you had, were saying, Susan, that you had added the the two consecutive years based on based the on feedback. These so are the comments mm -hmm. in the teacher's response. And the, and changing from one indicator on the observation system to two. So if it, the on the observation instrument, it it used to be and it currently is for the last school year. If you are rated in the lowest category of currently it's unsatisfactory. And in our new one, it would be ineffective on one indicator of the current 27 indicators, you would be considered inadequate, and that, that's in the current policy, mm -hmm. and receive a notice of inadequate classroom performance and have a performance improvement plan based on the way I interpreted the feedback, which was um, the comments revolved around just having one mm -hmm. and going to two. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to, I apologize, negotiate between the PowerPoint that we're not using yet, which maybe is part of my problem, and the policy advisory. So. The PowerPoint for the evaluation? Mm -hmm. option. Yeah. <laughs> You're looking ahead. I know. That's kind of a girl I am. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. So, I'm sorry. Keep going. Okay. So that's, so that's the, the definition. Then the next area where the board has um, some input there were, um, we, I'd like you to see, was the um, incentives for teachers who are um, deemed highly effective. And so you'll see that there was one indicator. The first one was, it, it really came out of the work, I feel, from the retention committee where we talked about teachers as leaders and teachers um, having that uh, leadership role. So here it would be that the, those teachers who are deemed highly effective would be given first consideration for uh, committee work at a district level, to be mentor teachers, to um, participate in curriculum cabinet right, and um, writing teams over the summer. And that received 89% um, support from the people who took the survey. Dr. Lugo, mm -hmm. comment number six, uh, one teacher made a comment about having an ELD classroom and concern about, um, let's, let me just read the comments so I don't misinterpret it. I teach ELD and once again my students will not be as successful as mainstream due to their inability to understand and comprehend academic language. Can you address that comment? Yeah, um, so the ELD teacher's perception is that they are at an unfair disadvantage at this, at this respondent number six, that they're at an unfair disadvantage for um, gaining those uh, higher performance classifications. 
when we had uh, the formulas reviewed by an external evaluator, actually came out in the report that our ELD teachers, based, because everything was based on growth, actually did better than our mainstream teachers. So um, that that is a, a, a something that we need to make sure our ELD teachers feel very comfortable with. And that evaluator was looking at 2010 data. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That evaluator is in the room. <laughs> yes, <laughs> she is. <laughs> okay, should I go on to the next one? Yes, please. Well, can I ask a question? So, here's, I guess, back to the little tricky thing about when do we get to call somebody highly effective or effective? Does this incentive mean based on the final? Summative teacher evaluation that includes student achievement data as well as the observation, I get to be designated as highly effective and therefore get incentives? Or could this be interpreted to mean if we were to do only one formal observation for a continuing teacher that in December of an academic year they're designated highly effective or effective and therefore are eligible during that current academic year? Do yes. you see where I'm yeah, going? My, my interpretation of that is that the evaluation system as a whole. So, okay. so then the next area to look at are incentives for teachers um, who are effective and highly effective to work at schools assigned a D or an F. Um, and here, this was actually put in that they could be on the school improvement team and make recommendations to the principal. Uh, in times where we don't have budget to incentivize teachers, you know, it would be nice to say for $10,000, um, we'll have you go over. But at this time, um, and 94% of the respondents agreed or strongly agreed with that statement. we turn the page, on the top of the next portion are protections for teachers who are assigned uh, to a school um, that have been a D or an F and they've been transferred over there. And what the intent of this one is that teachers can take their scores with them from the previous school year for one year when they go to the next school. And that had an 89% agreement of the respondents of agree and strongly agree. And then the last one were protections for teachers if a principal is designated in the lowest performance classification. And here the superintendent or her designee would review the evaluations of teachers in those. And that had a 94%. And then um, to go on with the policy to the, the next page, incentives uh, for highly effective principals. We do have a merit system uh, in place for our principals and that is um, in their evaluation tool and has been acted on by the board. And then for teachers who, uh, for principals who work in a school assigned or a D or an F, that the district, uh, that they can serve on the district level improvement teams. Were there any definitions that accompanied the survey for terms such as unwarranted adverse action? There were, there were not definitions of that. Okay, and then Susan, can you move your PowerPoint to the page you're on? Yeah. Okay, so Hold this is just the survey. The PowerPoint will be next. Um, well, when the, the next part is, this was just the we're right now in the uh, the policy advisories. So, Susan, this is just a kind of a bigger question, not, and I don't know if you and working with your colleagues across. Um, the state or the city have talked about this. So 
I sat on, I sit on the teacher evaluation committee for the ADE and get to travel with them all over the country visiting um, smart people talking about teacher evaluation. And in part of the ongoing conversations and creating the uh, new performance level descriptors for the State Board of Ed, we had an extensive dialogue and discussion about developing as a performance category. And that developing, according to State Board, you know, rule is not intended to be des you know, designated to a teacher for more than two years unless they happen to be a teacher that's new to a grade level or to the profession. Um, and so that is to say that after two years and in developing designation, we either have to indicate that that teacher is ineffective or they have to have improved to become effective. I don't see anything that addresses that concern or that issue or the way that we're going to handle that in these advisories. And so do you, am I missing something? Or uh, is Under the definition of inadequacy, number C, mm -hmm. and for effective 2015-16. Inadequacy of classroom performance? Yes. You don't have page numbers anyways. I'm sorry, I don't. But it's <clears throat> 9 of 19. 9 of 19. <clears throat> oh, I see. So thank you. So. So I guess that that's written that you're automatically going to be inadequate versus the positive assumption, which is you could be effective, right? In the way that it's read, but or is it just the way that I'm reading it? So it says effective in 2015, a designation of two consecutive school years in one of the two lowest performance classifications, unless the teacher is in first or second year employment or has been, uh, is teaching a subject or grade level. Great. So if I read that and I, it says, I've been in two consecutive years in the developing category, that you're automatically designating me inadequate versus I could be, I could have been in the developing category for two consecutive years, but based on the improvement plan that I've created with my leader in the coaching and support that I've got, I could be an effective teacher now, but this doesn't seem to give us the option of doing that. It seems like it just sort of says if you had it for two years, then you're automatically inadequate. Am I reading that wrong? Anyone else reading it the same way? I'm looking at my, I don't know where you are. Page 9 of 19 on the Oh, okay. I was reading 19. 9 on the policy advisory? Yes. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> there's a lot to this, but it's kind of confusing. Mm -hmm. And the first time that we've seen it, so that's, yes. that's not helpful. Not that that's any, that's not your fault. It's just there's a lot going on in here. Can you repeat what she said? I so if you look at the bottom page. of page nine, where it says inadequacy of classroom performance, it describes the teacher's classroom performance as inadequate if they fall into either one of those three options, A, B, or C. And option C is, while they don't designate, that the second lowest performance category is a teacher that's marked as developing. And the state board does not intend for developing to be assigned to a teacher who is a continuing teacher for more than two years. The expectation is that after those two years, the teacher is either effective or ineffective based on the evaluation, but that they don't want teachers to be languishing in a developing category for many years in a row. Um, so it's the way I read C currently, it gives me the impression that if I am in fact developing for two years in a row, I'm automatically inadequate based on that language versus 
I have the potential of being effective based on my evaluation. And that, I just want to make sure I'm, one, that that's not what it says, and two, that if we have concern about that, we can always sort of wordsmith the policy ourselves, but then that means that we're not probably likely to be able to, to prove it tonight, because I think we would probably want to go back and look at it. And, and this C, because it was so tricky, was provided for us by legal counsel. Uh, and so, because we we talked a lot, um, Jennifer and I, about the 2015-16, and we didn't have anything that addressed that. And so, um, so she she's the one that, that drafted that language and has been, been working with other school districts. Uh, on so in your conversation with Jennifer, was the intention of C to automatically designate a teacher that had been in developing for two years as ineffective? Unless they were new to the, to the system or had moved in grade levels. So there's not an option for a developing teacher based on their performance, performance plan, plan to actually get out of being in a, if they automatically. And this is, this is an assumption on my part. If they did not successfully complete their performance improvement plan and their performance is not showing in their test scores, that they would be ineffective. I need a clarification on what I'm looking at. So this link says the 2013, copyright 2013 by ASBA, but yet the section you were referring to said was different than what ASBA um, came up with because they had input from Jennifer. So my, I don't know if I'm looking at the right policy or not. It, it, <laughs> yeah, so the policy where, where we have, where it says in, in, from the advisory, it said import, insert your district um, here. And so the, the policy that you have has been reviewed by Jennifer. Okay. So not all of it is what exactly ASBA. what the advisory from ASBA. But it all has been reviewed by McClendon. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dr. Bogner? Dr. Lugo, um, does C not force the hand of the principal one way or another? So if the principal were to understandably, if it wasn't a first or second year teacher, give that person a, another developing, they would essentially be saying, you are inadequate. Mm -hmm. Correct. In order to not do that, would the teacher, would the principal not be forced, if they did not feel they were inadequate, to move them to effective. I don't know how they could move them to effective if their data didn't show that they were effective. So that's where okay, then, the conversation then I think is. Dr. Lesko has got something there. I mean, that's my worry is that we don't want to make it so that being developing as a teacher, yes, even you know, within the confines of it. It's a teacher that's new to the profession, new to a subject or new to a grade level is exempt from this particular piece. But, you know, the fact is, you know, quite honestly with common core standards, you know, the conversation at the state levels, every teacher is going to be developing for the next couple of years. I mean, in essence, um, because this is a whole new world of curriculum and instruction and assessments that go along with it. And so my, my concern is, as opposed to having the option within C to designate as an ineffective or potentially effective teacher that we are automatically saying, really in essence after one year, right? Because if I have a developing evaluation and the next year I'm on track to get a developing evaluation and I've been putting in, you know, my, I've worked towards my improvement plan and I'm still working on my improvement plan, I basically have a year and a couple of months to, to show improvement. In particular, if I'm a continuing teacher and I only get one formal observation, and then, you know, I mean, I think so we're compounding potentially the issues that we might have for classroom teachers. And I certainly don't want to, you know, have anyone hide out in a world of, you know, ineffectiveness. But we all, I don't think we also want to be punitive to, to teachers who are trying their best to implement the plan that they've created with their administrative team and with the coaches and support that they have, and then to basically say, well, you're automatically going to get 
the notice of inadequacy, and then all of the other stuff that goes along with it's going to automatically happen. Um, you know, it just seems that that's that's not the intent. I don't think that's not the intent that the state board had when they created that piece um, in their rule. Would you like for the administration to um, come up with a different option? And what are you thinking? Well, I mean, I just, I mean, I, I, I'm curious to, you know, we've got a classroom teacher, a current classroom teacher sitting on the board and a veteran classroom teacher. Yeah, I mean, I, if I'm the only one that's reading too much into it, then I'm happy to, to say, okay, fine, I'll go with the little group. But I feel like we don't want to set our teachers up for the potential, you know, negative consequences of something like this, where I don't think that the intentionality is that after having the discussions at the state board, it was clearly two full years of developing, and then then the trigger is you have to make a decision, um, not basically a year, and if you're on the verge of being developing for a second year, you're automatically inside the world of inadequacy, because that, you know, just takes it down the, a whole other road, not to mention a whole road of administrative burden on everybody, right? So it's not just a, a positive, a potentially negative experience for the classroom teacher, but then the administrator has to, you know, there's a lot in terms of the procedures that have to happen when you issue a notice of inadequacy. And, you know, I don't think that it's warranted after, in essence, one developing classification. I, 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 I feel um, it would be, it would be good towards Smith a little bit, have it more reflect on the state. Um, um, I'm, I'm not a wordsmither, so I want to know exactly how to do it, but um, I think when, when I was leading the policy, there were two things that really stuck out to me as a classroom teacher. Um, and knowing how we've handled this in the district where I currently teach in Phoenix Union High School District. Um, not that we do everything right, because we certainly don't, but um, uh, the one thing, and looking at the ASBA Policy Services Advisory, um, it says here in comment nine, this definition must be developed in consultation with the district's teachers. And like I said, according to this, there were two definitions given, but I don't feel like any teachers were brought to the table. And we all know that that's a big concern with teacher attention and what keeps coming up over and over in these committees. So I, I feel like to not include them in that process um, is, is just going to further those tensions. And, and it says right here that they're supposed to be there. So I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not sure, I feel like we're already violating something, you know, by not having them at the table. And, and creating this definition and working side by side with the administration. And that's basically what happened. Like I said, Phoenix Union is not perfect, but um, that they, they have a very good relationship, a strong relationship with their teachers, their teachers stay, and their teachers sat down with, you know, Ken Scribner and other uh, stakeholders in the community and, and in the district to create a plan regarding this crazy law, HB 2500, um, that, would, that would suit everybody and go along with the vision of the district. So, I, I know, I, I feel like there needs to be more wordsmithing, there needs to be equal opportunity for everybody to be at the table, you know, teachers, administrators, um, you know, maybe even board members, especially those who know everything about laws and policies. But, you know, um, I, think, I think that we kind of need to go back to the drawing board. And I understand that this is pressing and they want to go retroactive and they want you to, you know, uh, do one read, which is kind of crazy too. Um, but I, I, I feel very strongly that this is not adequate. Even the, so, you had mentioned that if we don't adopt this, you can't do informal, formal observations. But we already have a policy in place for teacher evaluation. So I'm not sure where the it, it's been recommended is. from from our legal counsel that until the board adopts. Um, this policy that we do not do about teacher evaluations. 
so but two weeks um, you, the board meets again in two weeks that's enough time to we have a strong um, evaluation committee uh, those would be the people I would turn to uh, and we would also need to speak with legal counsel because that C was drafted by me. Because I also don't feel comfortable with this policy. Um, the survey itself I have issues with because the number of participants was so low. I know that had to do with the timing of the bill and the summertime. Um, but it, to me, that it doesn't reflect adequate teacher input and, it, and it's not, um, it wasn't a consensus building process as has been recommended. And then the question that OD had brought up about um, the, the way it was formatted and it kind of didn't give teachers an option to, or staff an option to respond to both parts of it. Um, and the, the two sample definitions were not included either. I think that is important. So, I mean, I agree about going back to the drawing board. Absolutely. So we don't need a motion to not vote, do we? Correct. <laughs> um, do you have so do you have more to present on A? So, um, personnel A on this policy is the PowerPoint that there's a company no, is this so or is it for B? I don't have. I have it I'm sorry. Me. No, that's okay. okay. The, the PowerPoint is for the okay. going through with the other okay. the actually evaluation system. This was just for the policy, and I just wanted to to show you the survey. Okay. okay. So does the board want the administration to bring this back in two weeks? Are we willing to comment on that or are you just wanting to Yeah, I mean I'd like to see a motion back in two weeks and you know, I mean if to the extent that I mean I'm happy to help if there's anything that I can do, I will be with the state board on Monday talking about their um, governing board priorities and I will get, I can certainly ask Vincianas if he's started to see the executive director for the state board of education if um, they're starting to see anything I suspect that ASBA will be in attendance of the work study as well and so I can talk to Janice Palmer and anyone else who shows up to see what else is happening in terms of um, other districts moving forward and get clarification, I'll be happy to share that back with the administration. Um, so they'll be having meetings in the next two weeks and then bring it forward. Is the evaluation committee scheduled to meet? No, we are not scheduled to meet, but I, they are very dedicated and I'm sure they'll be at the table. Okay. Do you think that's, other board members, do you think that's the best place for this policy to go to get input from teachers. What is the have a collaborative? What's process? the makeup of the evaluation committee exactly? Oh well, the whole the committee as a whole um, has representation from every site and every grade level. That committee has diminished uh, since we've you know been working on the tool over the summer, and there are let's see about eight um, people on the evaluation committee. Um, there's a band teacher, a first grade teacher, a sixth grade teacher, um, who else has been there? A student achievement teacher, a principal, so it's, it's the small committee right now, it, it's a pretty tight knit group that have been with us for two and a half years. Do you think that you'd be able to try to schedule some? I know you said they kind of have, you know, gone the, the thing is disintegrated, right? So do you think they'd be willing to come back? Yes. Before the next I know them. Okay. Like, I'll talk to them personally. Um, but I would like to move quickly on that so that we can have the attorney review anything that we bring in front of you. And this committee is also based on consensus, right? It's, you know, based on, okay. That's, that's a good question, yeah. I mean, to the extent that it's possible, and I know time and schedules are hard, you know, the earlier we can get a draft before the meeting next, in two weeks. So, you know. Yeah, so there's some of them, the some I committee know. members are here in the audience tonight. Maybe they want to work with me this evening. <laughs> <laughs> As they furiously shake their heads, no. <laughs> I'm sure Susan will buy you pizza. <laughs> I feel a little better than that. <laughs> This is 
such an important topic, and um, so thank you for bringing the committee back together to revisit it and address our concerns. I think we just need some more information, and we really want to make sure that there's more collaboration um, with teachers in this process because this affects them so greatly. Any other uh, comments or questions or direction you want to provide as board members to the administration on this topic? Thank you, Dr. Lugo. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Personnel, uh, Section 9, Number B, is approving revisions to the standard evaluation system for teachers. Do you have a PowerPoint? I understand you. 